Today we're going to talk about grow up. Has anybody ever told you just to grow up? Yes. <laughs> yes, you, that is definitely for sure. But, but we're all told that at one point or another to grow up, to act our age or whatever we have to do. But what we're going to talk about today is that right relationships mean right living for the Christian. And in the Christian life, doctrine and duty always go together. No matter how you look at it, doctrine and duty always go together. And what we, what we believe helps to determine how we behave. Because what you are, we'll look at a little bit, what you are behind closed doors is who you really are. And so you look as good on the outside as you do on the inside. And so we have to translate our learning into living and show people how we walk with God. And so the first thing we have to do in the Grow Up Principles is develop a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at Romans 12, 1 through 3. Romans 12, 1 through 3. Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which means well-pleasing, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, and that simply means the world system. Not, not the people of the world, just the world system. So don't be conformed to this world system, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove or approve, is a, is a correct word, what the will of God is. And that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. And what you find here is that the will of God has three aspects. It's good, it's acceptable, and it's perfect. So God's will for our lives are always good, acceptable, and perfect. For, the, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think more, of your, uh, more highly of yourself than uh, he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allowed it to each a measure of faith. So that's important for us to understand as we look into this thing. And as we look at our relationship with God, we have three principles that are involved in it. Three basic principles. The first is, when you come to know Christ, you give God your body. You give Him your body. You want to do the best you can. So you, you try to control your body, which you find sometimes pretty hard to do, but you control it as best you can. And then, you give God your mind. Your mind controls your body. So you, Paul says... To renew your mind, right? So to renew it. And you have to almost renew it every day because every day you're confronted with new, new temptations, new problems, new difficulties all the way along the way. And then we have to give God our will. So you give your will to God and your will controls everything. Someone once asked me to define sin. And the definition for sin is very simply exerting your will above the will of God. And when you do that, you're in the sin realm. That's where sin happens. When we decide we know better, then God knows. We want to do better, then God does. And so it affects everything about us. And so here's a life principle. Number one, the world wants to control your mind. God wants to transform your mind. People are always saying, oh, I, I, I've changed my mind. That, that, that doesn't get it. You have to transform the mind. The mind has to become different in every, every area of life. Some people get it right off the bat. Others, it takes a while. And others, it might take a few years. But they finally learn that you have to transform your mind because that's what God wants from you. He wants to transform mind. And then your mind controls your body and your will controls your mind. It is only as we yield to God that His power can take control of our willpower. And we want God to take control of everything in us. Especially when you're in an environment like this. Where all your residents are here. You're, you're living close together. You're having meals together. Tempers can flare. People can get their feelings hurt. All kinds of things. But we give our lives over to Christ and let Christ uh, transform us. And so the second principle is be sincere in our ministry and work. That's what Paul is saying. We must be sincere in what we do. Now, when God calls us to service, and every believer is called to serve God in one fashion or another, when God calls us to service, it affects everything we do for the rest of our lives. 
And so he says in Romans 12, 3, for through, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. And that's really the problem we get into. We think we're better than we really are. And when we get that way, we get into trouble. But to think so as to the sound judgment, as God has allotted to each measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Now, what that means is this. We have a room here of about 28, 29, maybe 30 people, okay? If you're a believer in Jesus, you have a call upon your life to do things for the Lord. But not everybody gets the same call. Some of you may be called to, do, to be dishwashers. If God's called you to be a dishwasher, you do it with the best that you have. God's called others of you teachers, and you want to teach the best that you can. He has a call He's put on each of us. And so we have to live according to what the call is that God has upon us. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us in agreement with the faith, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. We're to exercise them accordingly. In other words, we must do what God has called us to do. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. If service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. These are the things, and Paul goes on to list all kinds of things that we are involved in as believers and how God uses us for his glory. And so when you look behind the closed door where most of us live, we don't like to show outwardly what we have inside. You know, has anybody ever said to you, said, well, my religion is personal? Mm -hmm. Have you had that said to you? And religion can be personal. I want you to keep it to yourself. But if you have a relationship with Jesus, you have to get outside that. You have to show that relationship in order to reach people for Christ. Too many people are operating under religion. It's not getting them anywhere. Okay, so here are five closed door principles. One, you need to be genuine. As you work with God in the marketplace or wherever you live, be genuine, be real. Now, don't go beat up somebody and say, I'm real today. You didn't laugh very well at that. And that was a good joke. Okay, <laughs> okay. and then you need to take off the mask and love people. Whenever people go to church, don't they just sort of wear a mask? You know, husband and wife get up on Sunday morning. They get the kids ready. They're fighting the whole time. They fight. They get in the car. They fight all the way to church. They park. They go in the front door, and then everything is hunky-dory. <laughs> yeah. Flora and I encountered that when we were members of the church over in Hendersonville years ago. We uh, were in the five-year-old department. And you can learn a lot about a family from a five-year-old. <laughs> I mean, I knew things about people. I could have blackmailed them. <laughs> but this one mother brought a little girl in, and I shoot her mother on the way, and then I asked her, how, how are things at home? They fought all day, ever since they got up this morning. Fight, 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 fight. And so I told the mother in church, I told her, I said, uh, your daughter sort of told on you. She said, oh, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But also remember, this thing called faith is not a game. It is not a game. We have, to, we, we have to live our role to the max. Okay? And then you are to hate evil and hold on to what is good. And uh, he doesn't ever list, Paul doesn't list the commandments of what not to do in this chapter, but you know what he's talking about. He's just saying anything that's evil, you've got to hate it. You've got to stay away from it. And that's why we, uh, Flora and I, have said many times that we don't believe this, this phrase when somebody says, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I got a Greek word for that, and it's in the English language, and it means hogwash. Because once you give your life to Christ, you're controlled by the Spirit. And that doesn't mean that you won't choose to sin, but you're not controlled by it. You're, you're controlled by what God wants to do in your life. So you hate evil, and you hold on to what is good. And the sign of how genuine your faith is, is found in how you behave behind closed door. I said that to you earlier. 
What you are behind closed door is who you really are. What you do behind closed doors is really who you are. How you act is really who you are. And that poses a problem for a lot of believers. So the third principle is we need to be devoted to one another. Be devoted to one another. Now, our scripture there is, is 9 through 11. Paul says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor that what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. That's what God wants from us. He wants our very best wherever we go. He wants us to put foot our best foot. He wants us to dress our best. He wants us to act our best. He wants us to be the best. And, uh, you know, if uh, you... I, I'm going to pick on the ladies for a minute. If you ladies, when you get up in the morning, what does your hair look like? <laughs> Scary, huh? Well, you got to watch that. So you, what do you do? You brush it out, you comb it, whatever it takes to get that hair down because you don't want anybody out there to see what you look like in here. Right? That's a mask. But I think it's a good mask because I don't want to see you when you get up in the morning. It's, it's not, that's not wholesome. That's not. But Paul is saying, don't lag behind in diligence. Be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Whatever you do, you're in service to Christ. And so you make it that way for Him. Whatever you do, like uh, when James comes up here on, say, Wednesday, and he begins visiting several of you, he's, putting a, he's wanting you to come and put your best foot forward to be the best person you can possibly be. Well, that's how we keep in touch with you and how we know what's going on. James tells me. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. Now, I'm going to tell you some stuff about yourself afterwards, okay? <laughs> so you need to be devoted to one another. And then you must be excited about the work you're called to do. You know, uh, back when I was 15, 15, God called me to preach the gospel. I preached my first message at the Miami Rescue Mission that year. And I've been preaching ever since. Since I was 15. It's a life call. You don't get rid of it. It's a life call. And when I get to where I, I can't uh, speak like I need to anymore, I'll get Victor or James and I'll teach them what they need to know. And they better do what I tell them. <laughs> but... Uh, but that's my role. Now I'm more of a trainer than I am a pastor. I just like, love to preach, so I won't let them do it yet. Okay? And then uh, we want to look at these verses. Verse 12. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. How many of you have the gift of hospitality? Yeah. Oh, no, we don't have any more hospitality people here than just Becky and Flora. Well, I, I'm kind of disappointed. No, I'm not really. But that's good. Okay. Uh, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. The same mind. Paul tells us over in Philippians chapter 2 that we are to have the same mind as Christ. The same mind. He said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And that's what he requires. We'd be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. And that's how God takes care of us. And so here's our life application principle. Now just think about your church where, you, where, where your membership is. Now look at this. If you make your church out to be a terrible place, full of terrible people, no one will want to be a part of it. You should be excited about what God is doing. Your enthusiasm for serving God ought to be contagious. It's got to be. See, it doesn't matter how, whether we have 30 here, we have 9 or 8. We, we speak to the people that are here, not to the empty chairs. We give our best in spite of your meanness. 
And then uh, be positive. Rejoice in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who, who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil. To anyone, respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Paul is saying, just try to be at peace with people. You don't have to agree with them. You don't have to agree with everything they say. But try to be peaceful. Now, how many of you are, are on social media? Any of you on social media? We see some vindication on social media. You know, somebody will say something, somebody else will come back on and say, stupid, I know better than that. You know, and we get even with people. I used to have this phrase I like to use. I did it jokingly, but I had to stop. But somebody uh, put something, said something to me, and I told them, I said, that's okay. Just understand, I'm not going to get even. I'm going to get ahead. So just pay attention. Well, I never did get ahead, but I didn't get even either. But I had to stop that because that wasn't very nice. Mainly. Okay? Never take your own revenge. Love, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written... Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is, is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And Paul's giving some good advice, isn't he? As we follow along. To be joyful means to look at the glass as half full, not half empty. Positive people look at the glass and say, that's half full. And they drink it. Negative people say, oh, that's half empty. I, I don't want to touch it. But you always look at it from the positive side. Glass is always better half full than empty. Amen? Amen? Amen. Thank you. Very good. So we have to be positive. Be patient. <laughs> I told James I was going to preach to myself on that one today. Be patient. Although, I'm a lot more patient today than my wife is. She is terrible in patience. She, she's driving that car. She tells people to get out of the way. I'm coming through. We get there fast. I'm kidding. I tell you, your patience is a hard thing to get. It is very hard. It's a hard, hard thing to get. And I, I, I hate it when I read Paul and he says, be patient. And I'm thinking, oh, man. Yeah. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. These three areas will, will absolutely relate to patience in your life. If you are rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, you're at the high point of your Christian experience. And God gives those to us to let us know it leads to our patience. Okay? Three patient principles. The Bible says we can be confident that the plan of God and the power of God are greater than any problems we're going to face. So you remember that. That's on your paper. I want you to remember that. The Bible says we can be confident. That's totally confident. That the plan of God and the power of God are greater than any problems we're going to face. So whatever you're facing... God already knows about it. He didn't wake up this morning and say, oh, I forgot to tell Becky that. No, he, he already knows. He, he's not going to wake up and say, oh, I meant to tell Victor. You know, I forgot to do that. <laughs> God hasn't forgotten a thing. He knows all about us. Second, we can be patient because we know God is using these things in our lives to strengthen us. And don't look at the temporary situation Look at the eternal benefits of that temporary situation you're going through. Because what you're going through is only temporary. It's not there for a lifetime. It's only temporary. And you look to the Father, He'll get you through that temporary situation. So important. Number seven, be prayerful. That's Romans 12, 10 to 13. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, 
Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. And that's what God does for us. And then number eight is be hospitable. Contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Now, Paul says we're to do that. For me, that's hard. For Flora, it's easy. That's why God put us together. He had a sense of humor. But he put us together. But anyway, that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to practice hospitality and be fervent in prayer. And then number nine, we are to be forgiving. We are to forgive people. Now that's hard, isn't it? Real hard. But we need to forgive each other. Romans 12, 14 and 15. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's what God wants us to do. Three forgiving principles. One, you are to forgive others for what they do to you. Not for, you all not do anything to them, but you need their forgiveness. You need to forgive others for what they do to you. And so you look at them and you can say, I forgive you for that. And it doesn't say you have to forget. That's Benjamin Franklin. Jesus just said forgive. Forgive 70 times 7. Forgive them. And then when you encounter them again, you, you, you can fellowship with them in increments. A little at a time till the whole relationship's restored. Number two, you're not supposed to be battling one another. And so much of the time we do that, don't we? And then you must learn to forgive and love one another. We have to do that. That's part of our Christian faith. Then number 10, be there for the one, oh, be there for one another. And that's Romans 12, 16 to 21. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of God. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge. Beloved, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for, he, for, it, is his, for it is written. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's how we live. When one of us acts when one of us has a victory, we should celebrate. And when one of us has a, has a difficult time, we should be there to cry with them. We have to be there for each other. Being prejudiced, discriminating, etc. will destroy your life faster than anything else. The economic and social level of the people around you should not matter. You are to get along with one another and not think that you are any better than anyone else, because you're not. Then number three, this is a list of things you need to be doing to grow in a way that brings glory and honor to God. This applies to your personal life, to your family, to your workplace. Grow up. Just grow up. And that's what God wants us to know today. Amen? Amen.